Well, welcome to our Bible study class, where today we're going to consider the subject of the nobleman's face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. A number of years ago, when my children, my, my, my daughters were, were quite young, uh, the oldest two daughters were perhaps about nine or seven years of age from memory, and we were, we were driving to our best friend's place to pick up the two young girls to take them to our Friday night study group class for young people. And when we got there, the, the youngest of their two girls, which were the same age as my daughter's, a seven-year-old, she came out and said, look, we don't think we're going to be able to come because her older sister, her nine-year-old sister, had fallen out of a, of a small tree that she'd been climbing and, and bumped her head. And, and my wife, who was a, a nursing assistant at the time, went in to see her friend and to, and to check on her daughter to see how she was. And she noticed that her pupils were dilating. And she said to her friend that, you know, she probably would be best to get her to a doctor just to check her out because when your eyes dilate like that, that can often be a symptom for a problem. And so the mother left her other children with us and she went off to the doctor. And when she got to the doctors, the doctor took one look at her and rang for an ambulance to take her on the 30 kilometer trip into the city to the Royal Melbourne Children's Hospital, a renowned children's hospital. And uh, the doctor was quite concerned about the condition of this little nine-year-old girl. And what happened was when the ambulance came and took her, her condition had become so grave so quickly that, that the ambulance had to drive very carefully and very slowly. And be, because her condition was, was failing, they had to make a couple of stops along the way. But sadly, on one of those occasions, when they finally made a stop because her condition was failing, the little girl passed away. And of course, you know, you can imagine the, the, the trauma that the mother was going through on this journey in the ambulance, you know, watching her daughter come in and out of consciousness only to eventually pass away. And, and it's, it's that emotion of a parent with a child that brings us to the subject today of this nobleman's son. Because this, this nobleman, this, this man of, of a royal ruler, I suppose, is, is another way for us to understand who this man was. He had this son, and, and we are told in, in John chapter 4 and verses 46 to 47 that this son was just a child and that he was gravely ill and he was on the, on the verge of death. And we read these words in John 4, verses 46 to 47. It says, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman or a royal ruler whose son or child was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. It's interesting that, that it's only John who, who writes or mentions about this city, this little village of Cana, and, and he does that twice, and that's clearly significant. Once, obviously, with that miracle of water into wine, which is called the first sign of John, and now again in this second sign of John with this nobleman, this ruler. And Cana, of course, is a it's a very small village. It's a, it's a very unimportant, unimportant town in the, in the grand scale of things in Israel. It's, it's not very far from the Sea of Galilee. But as unimportant as it is to the, to, the, to the land of Israel, to the nation of Israel, it's always very important to God. It's not always about the big places, the major places, the significant places. God is interested in the small in the insignificant places and people. He's interested in everybody, great or small. And the same applies to us. Whether we are well-known or whether we are not, God is interested in us. God is invested in us. It doesn't matter who we are. And in this world, most of us are insignificant. Most of us are, are not even known outside our own little group of friends. But to God, we're important. He's interested and invested in us. 
And so in verse 47, the news of Jesus coming out of Samaria and now out of Judah also, and he's coming to Cana. And, and Cana is about 40 kilometres away from Capernaum. Capernaum sits right on the shores of Galilee. And we're told that this, this certain nobleman hears about Jesus coming. So the news has got from Cana to Capernaum that Jesus has come to town. And, and we don't really know who this, who this nobleman was. As I say, in, in some translations, he's referred to as a royal official. But whoever he, lived, he is, he lives in this city of Capernaum. As I say, about 40 kilometres away. And, and he's desperate for help. He's desperate for help. He, his child is sick. His child is dying. He's, he's at death's doorstep. And he's doing what any self-respecting parent does. He's asking everybody. He's searching everywhere. He's trying to find somebody, anybody, who can help because his child is in a serious condition, just like that little girl was when she made her way in that ambulance to the children's hospital. He desperately needed a doctor. He needed a good doctor, but there was nobody that could help him. And despite his search, there was no help. And then suddenly he hears about Jesus coming into Cana, and it's it's only 14 kilometres away, and he, and he can't wait to see if, if Jesus eventually makes his way into Capernaum because his child is at death's door. He was desperately in need of a miracle, and Jesus was just the man he needed. When we, when we think about that circumstance, and we think about the fact that this story appears as John's second sign, immediately a red flag is, is, is waved at us because there's a problem here. And the problem is this. This man in his desperate search to find somebody to heal his son, to heal his child, when he hears about Jesus and he hears about the miracles that Jesus has been doing down in, in Judah and in Jerusalem, he immediately makes a beeline for Jesus. Not because he's Jesus, but because of the miracles that Jesus is doing. He's treating Jesus like a doctor. He's treating Jesus like a miracle worker, somebody who can fix or cure his son. And so when he comes face to face with Jesus in this enormous encounter, because his life or his son's life is on the line. He comes to Jesus and he appeals to Jesus to come down to his house in Capernaum. And, and what, we, what we notice is it's a strange response from Jesus, who's, who's the most compassionate and loving and caring person you could ever meet. But, but Jesus' response to him are these words in verse 48. Jesus says, Unless ye see signs and wonders... Ye will by no means believe in the translation that I have here. It's unless you people see the sign. See, he's not just speaking to this nobleman. He's speaking to everybody that's gathered there. And so the New King James Version translates it, unless you people, unless all you people see signs and wonders, none of you will by any means believe. In other words, You'll only believe if you see a miracle. And, 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 and the key word here is this word, ye, or you people. It's a plural word, and he's using it to involve everybody that's listening to him. And as I say, it seems like a strange and almost uncaring, even a, even a rebuke in sorts. But we have to understand that Jesus is telling them the way it was just as he tells us the way it is. You know, Jesus doesn't mince words when there's a message to be given. The man had come to Jesus looking for a miracle. That's what he'd come to Jesus for. But Jesus had come to Cana looking and searching for men and women of faith. 
So both men were searching. He was searching for a miracle worker, but Jesus was searching for men and women of faith. Jesus wanted people to come to him to listen to his message, to hear the word of God. That's what Jesus was searching for. His motive for coming to Jesus was not about Jesus' message. This nobleman's purpose in searching and coming to Jesus was not about Jesus' message. His motive for coming to Jesus was all about a miracle. The nobleman was searching for a miracle, not a Messiah. And you know, that's the problem. And, and it's still a problem today. It's still a problem today. Our trust is not to be in signs or miracles or wonders. But our trust is to be in the one who performs the miracles, who speaks the word of God. So the sign of the miracle here is almost irrelevant, except, of course, to the recipient. You know, we often pray for miracles of health and for healings today. When people get sick from various things, we pray for their healings, especially with, with COVIDs and, and cancers and other diseases that are relevant today. But how often do we pray for a better understanding of the Word of God? How often do we pray to know more about the Word of God? How often do we pray even just for an average day? You know, these days our, our lives seem to be full of drama and and, 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 and things going on that are, that are concerning and, 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 and worrying to us, how often do we pray just for an average day, for a drama-free day? But all too often our, our prayers are like, like a vending machine. You know, where, you, where a vending machine is, gimme, 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 gimme. And, and our prayers can become like that. And, and that's no way for us to approach the throne of grace to approach our God, to approach our King. You know, we, we need to remember who we're speaking to when we are praying to our God, when we are praying to our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember to honour him. We need to remember to reverence him, to acknowledge him as our creator, as our sustainer, to acknowledge him for all the blessings he brings into our life and to believe in him, to trust him, to listen to his word, to carefully take note of the things he wants us to hear, to serve him and not to serve ourselves. You know, Jesus says, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, the word of God, you are my disciples indeed. So we need to abide in his word. This is the key element of, 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 of this particular miracle, this sign. In verse 49, the nobleman has come to Jesus because he wants a miracle. And the question is, would he ever see Jesus as anything else? Such was his desperation. Such was his emotion. And that's the choice that Jesus is going to give him as he now comes face to face with him. As he stands looking at Jesus, as he comes to Jesus face to face, anguish and despair etched all across his face. It must have been a desperate moment for him. Fear and, and trembling and perhaps even, even shaking with concern for his son's life not really knowing that here he was in, in Cana of Galilee. He's 40 kilometres from home. Maybe the worst has already affected him. Maybe his son has already passed. But now we see as he, as he comes to Jesus this second time, he now speaks to Jesus with, with a respect, with, with a humility, where he addresses Jesus as Sir or Lord, and he says to Jesus, Sir or Lord, come down to my home in Capernaum. 
before my child dies. You know, the, the anguish in this man is, is something that, that is almost indescribable. You know, we need to imagine people that have gone through that experience, like our friend and her little daughter. The anguish, the despair, the, the absolute concern and worry. And it's here at this moment, at this moment it appears that Jesus now sees a grain of faith taking root in this nobleman's heart. Something is happening to this man. Something is touching his heart now. And Jesus is going to give him a choice in verse 50. Because Jesus is not going to do what the man's asked him to do. He's not going to do what the nobleman has asked him to do. The nobleman wanted Jesus to come down to his home in Capernaum, 40 kilometres away. And Jesus is not going to do that. Jesus doesn't do that. As the, as the man addresses Jesus and says, come down to Capernaum before my child dies, Jesus says, go. Go home. And, and, and you think of those simple and yet profound words which are followed by your son liveth, your son is healed. And the question now is, is he going to believe or is he going to doubt? What will he do? You know, and it, you, you put any one of us in that circumstance and, and when your son's life is on the line, it's, it's a very testing situation to be placed in. You know, in this face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, this man is moving from just wanting his son to be healed by Jesus to understanding that without Jesus, his son would die. And that's where we need to be as well. It's not enough for us just to want to be healed by Jesus. It's all about without Jesus, we have no hope. It's not about the miracle. It's about the word. It's about the word of God. It's about the message. You know, we, we believe in Jesus' message of faith, hope and love. I know we do. We believe in the message of the coming kingdom of God and Jesus as the king. And because of that belief, that belief in God and that belief in Jesus, we are told and we believe that we are saved. And we are told that the nobleman believed. When Jesus said, go home, your son liveth, he believed it. It says in the word of God that he believed the word, the word of Jesus. Notice that. He believes the word, the word of Jesus, the word of God. Now we start to see his faith grow. He came to Jesus to see a miracle. That's what he came to Jesus for. He came to Jesus to ask Jesus to come to his son's place, to come to his son's bedside in Capernaum and perform a miracle. But he's going to leave Jesus without seeing a miracle. He's going to leave this man that he came for a miracle cure, and he's going to leave him in faith, in belief, that what he wanted has already been done, even though he hasn't seen it. He's going to believe in something he hasn't seen. He just now believes. He now knew he didn't need to see the miracle performed. He now knew he just needs to believe the word. And, and that's the message for us. And that newfound faith and belief was going to be seen in action as it needs to be seen in action by us. Look at verses 51 to 53. We read there that it says, And as he was now going back to Capernaum, 
His servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father, the nobleman, knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said, Your son lives. Now I said earlier that, that Cana and Galilee are about 40 kilometres apart. If the father had any doubts about whether his son had been cured and made well again, then he would have dashed home in a hurry. He wouldn't have delayed getting home. He would have wanted to see, is, is my son okay? Is he not? And he would have raced home. And, and, and even at a casual walking pace of five kilometres an hour, if he had have left at 1pm, which is the seventh hour, if he'd have left at that time to, to race home, to check if what Jesus said was true, if he'd done that, even allowing for an hour's break halfway home, he'd have been home by 10 p.m. that night. But, but when he comes and he meets these servants, perhaps at the halfway mark, so he's only gone perhaps a halfway or two-thirds of the way, so he hasn't even gone the whole journey, and he asks them, when was his son healed? And they say, yesterday. Yesterday at one o'clock. So what's, what's happened between the time that Jesus said your son lives and this journey of this nobleman back home? And what's happened is faith. Faith and belief in the word, in the word that Jesus spoke, in the message that Jesus gave him. He's now started to make his way home, but he's not in any rush. Most likely, somewhere along his journey, he has stopped overnight, rested, recovered from his mad dash to Cana to see Jesus and, and to get him to do the miracle. But, but all that fear, all that worry is now gone. And he's now living in faith and belief. And so he rests up for the night and continues his, his journey at a very casual pace where he now meets these servants the following day. And they tell him that yesterday at one o'clock, your son was healed. You know, in fear, he had raced to find Jesus in Cana. But in faith, he casually walked home, knowing that his son was healed. You know, it's a similar story to that little nine-year-old girl, the story that I told you about at the beginning of this talk. You know, that little girl was a close family friend. And when I spoke about her at the start and I told her, I told you that, that she died in that ambulance and that was true. In fact, she died twice. They, they revived her from the first occasion she stopped breathing and they went a little bit further and she passed away a second time. But they managed to revive her again and Eventually, they got her to the hospital and they managed to treat her and she recovered. And you can imagine the prayers that were given by that mother in that ambulance during the course of that hour and a half journey from her home to the hospital 30 kilometres away. And so the mother's prayers were answered inside the ambulance, even though she didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And today, that little girl's a 45-year-old mother of two. The key to this sign, the key to this miracle, is not the miracle itself. It's the fact that the nobleman believed the word of God. And the mother of this little girl believes in the word of God. She is a sister in Christ. And she believed just as this nobleman believed. And so must we. The key is to know Jesus, to believe in him, to trust him. Because if you have that, you have everything we need. And if it takes, if it takes a moment like this where, where a child's life hangs in the balance to wake us up and to shake us up and to bring us to Christ, then praise be to God. In faith, this nobleman now walks back home to his son. Faith is seen in action by this man 
that no longer is he panicking and stressing and racing around. He's now calm and collected in faith. You know, faith is seen in action by so many people. You know, we look at the scriptures and we see men like Noah who built an ark even before it ever rained. Like Abraham, prepared to offer his son up with his outstretched hand, ready to plunge it into his son. Just like Elijah, who, who soaked that altar, that sacrifice, soaked it with water before he asked God to bring down fire and consume it. Just like Esther, who went before the king without an invitation, putting her life on the line. It could have cost her her life. But she went there in faith. And so many others. And the question remains, how are we acting out our lives of faith? Do we love others consistently? Do we forgive others regularly? Do we share Jesus' message fervently? Do we worship God passionately? Do we trust God implicitly? Do we walk with God proudly? You know, these are just a few examples of our life and our walk in faith. Paul says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And just as the nobleman had chosen to believe now, he had chosen between belief and unbelief, but he chooses to believe, so must we, and so do we. But we can't just say it in words. It can't just be words that, that fall from our lips. We have to live it. Our hope and our faith is not about miracles, but the one who spoke the word, who gave the word. We desperately need, in this life, and in these last days, we desperately need to be filled with the word. Our greatest need is not to be healed of our aches and our pains and our suffering. Our greatest need is our relationship with our Heavenly Father, with our God, and with our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. If we believe in God, if we trust in God, if we follow Jesus, then we have all we need. So what began in this sign as 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 a journey of faith for the Father, having come face to face with Jesus in that remarkable encounter at Cana, what began as a sign of faith in him grew into a faith for the whole family because the whole family believed. And the end result was that faith was seen by his whole family not just him. The end result of that faith was that two miracles were done that day. A child was healed from certain death and a father and his family were born in faith. Both were needed, but only one was eternal. One affected the boy, while the other affected the whole family, just as we are a family, just as we have been offered the choice to believe and live or not to believe and die. And so now we together with that nobleman and that family, we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We await eternity to live forever in the kingdom of God. And so as we come to the end of this sign, we read these words in verse 54. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Amen.